Chapter Forty of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Forty o'brien and myself take a step each parry passu a family reunion productive of anything but unity my uncle not always the best friend a few days afterwards i left my card with my address with the first lord and the next day received a letter from his secretary which to my delight informed me that my commission had been made out some days before i hardly need say that i hastened to take it up and when paying my fee to the clerk i ventured at a hazard to inquire whether he knew the address of lieutenant o'brien no replied he i wish to find it out for he has this day been promoted to the rank of commander i almost leapt with joy when i heard this good news i gave o'brien's address to the clerk hastened away with my invaluable piece of parchment in my hand and set off immediately for my father's house but i was met with sorrow my mother had been taken severely ill and i found the house in commotion doctors and apothecaries and nurses running to and fro my father in a state of excitement and my dear sister in tears spasm succeeded spasm and although every remedy was applied the next evening she breathed her last i will not attempt to describe the grief of my father who appeared to feel remorse at his late unkind treatment of her my sister and myself these scenes must be imagined by those who have suffered under similar bereavements i exerted myself to console my poor sister who appeared to cling to me as to her only support and after the funeral was over we recovered our tranquillity although the mourning was still deeper in our hearts than in our outward dress i had written to o'brien to announce this mournful intelligence and like a true friend he immediately made his appearance to console me o'brien had received the letter from the admiralty acquainting him with his promotion and two days after he arrived went to take up his commission i told him frankly by what means he had obtained it and he again concluded his thanks by reference to the mistake of the former supposition that of my being the fool of the family by the powers it would be well for any man if he had a few such foolish friends about him continued he but i won't blarney you peter you know what my opinion always has been so we'll say no more about it when he came back we had a long consultation as to the best method of proceeding to obtain employment for o'brien was anxious to be again afloat and so was i i regretted parting with my sister but my father was so morose and ill-tempered that i had no pleasure at home except in her company indeed my sister was of opinion that it would be better if i were away as my father's misanthropy now unchecked by my mother appeared to have increased and he seemed to view me with positive dislike it was therefore agreed unanimously between my sister and me and o'brien who was always of our counsels that it would be advisable that i should be again afloat i can manage him much better when alone peter i shall have nothing to occupy me and me away from him as your presence does now and painful as it is to part with you my duty to my father and my wish for your advancement induce me to request that you will if possible find some means of obtaining employment spoken like a hero as ye are miss ellen notwithstanding your pretty face and soft eyes said o'brien and now peter for the means to bring it about if i can get a ship there is no fear for you 
as i shall choose you for my lieutenant but how is that to be managed do you think that you can come over the old gentleman at eagle park at all events i'll try replied i i can be but flawed o'brien accordingly the next day i set off for my grandfather's and was put down at the lodge at the usual hour about eleven o'clock i walked up the avenue and knocked at the door when it was opened i perceived a hesitation among the servants and a constrained air which i did not like i inquired after lord privilege the answer was that he was pretty well but did not see anybody is my uncle here said i yes sir replied the servant with a significant look and all his family are here too are you sure that i cannot see my grandfather said i laying a stress upon the word i will tell him that you are here sir replied the man but even that is against orders i had never seen my uncle since i was a child and could not even recollect him my cousins or my aunt i had never met with in a minute an answer was brought requesting that i would walk into the library when i was ushered in i found myself in the presence of lord privilege who sat in his usual place and a tall gentleman whom i knew at once to be my uncle from his likeness to my father here is the young gentleman my lord said my uncle looking at me sternly he what oh i recollect well child so you've been behaving very ill sorry to hear it good-bye behaving ill my lord replied i i am not aware of having so done reports are certainly very much against you nephew observed my uncle dryly some one has told your grandfather what has much displeased him i know nothing about it myself then some rascal has slandered me sir replied i my uncle started at the word rascal and then recovering himself replied well nephew what is it that you require of lord privilege for i presume this visit is not without a cause sir replied i my visit to lord privilege was first to thank him for having procured me my commission as lieutenant and to request the favour that he would obtain my active employment which a line from him will effect immediately i was not aware nephew that you had been made lieutenant but i agree with you that the more you are at sea the better his lordship shall sign the letter sit down shall i write it sir said i to my uncle i know what to say yes and bring it to me when it is written i felt convinced that the only reason which induced my uncle to obtain me employment was the idea that i should be better out of the way and that there was more risk at sea than on shore i took a sheet of paper and wrote as follows my lord may i request that your lordship will be pleased to appoint the bearer of to a ship as soon as convenient as i wish him to be actively employed i am my lord etc etc why not mention your name it is of no consequence replied i as it will be delivered in person and that will ensure my speedy appointment the letter was placed before his lordship for signature it was with some difficulty that he was made to understand that he was to sign it the old gentleman appeared much more imbecile than when i last saw him i thanked him folded up the letter and put it in my pocket at last he looked at me and a sudden flash of recollection appeared to come across his mind well child so you escaped from the french prison hey and how's your friend what is his name eh o'brien my lord o'brien cried my uncle he is your friend then sir i presume it is you am indebted for all the inquiries and reports which are so industriously circulated in ireland the tampering with my servants and other impertinences i did not choose to deny the truth although i was a little fluttered by the sudden manner in which it came to light i replied 
I never tamper with any people's servants, sir. No, said he, but you employ others to do so. I discovered the whole of your proceedings after the scandal left for England. If you apply the word scandal to Captain O'Brien, sir, in his name I contradict it. As you please, sir, replied my uncle in a passion. But you will oblige me by quitting this house immediately and expect nothing more either from the present or the future lord privilege except that retaliation which your infamous conduct has deserved i felt much irritated and replied very sharply from the present lord privilege i certainly expect nothing more neither do i from his successor but after your death uncle i expect that the person who succeeds to the title will do all he can for your humble servant i wish you a good morning uncle my uncle's eyes flashed fire as i finished my speech which indeed was a very bold and a very foolish one too as it afterwards proved i hastened out of the room not only from the fear of being turned out of the house before all the servants but also from the dread that my letter to the first lord might be taken from me by force but i never shall forget the scowl of vengeance which crossed my uncle's brows as i turned round and looked at him as i shut the door i find my way out without the assistance of the servants and hastened home as fast as i could o'brien said i on my return there is no time to be lost the sooner you hasten to town with this letter of introduction the better it will be for depend upon it my uncle will do me all the harm that he can i then repeated to him all that had passed and it was agreed that o'brien should take the letter which having reference to the bearer would do as well for him as for me and if o'brien obtained an on appointment i was sure not only of being one of his lieutenants but also of sailing with a dear friend the next morning o'brien set off for london and fortunately saw the first lord the day after his arrival which was a levy day the first lord received the letter from o'brien and requested him to sit down he then read it inquired after his lordship asked whether his health was good etc o'brien replied that with the blessing of god his lordship might live many years that he had never heard him complain of ill health or which was not false if not true i could not help observing to o'brien when he returned home and told me what had passed that i thought considering what he had expressed with respect to white lies and black lies that he had not latterly adhered to his own creed that's very true peter and i've thought of it myself but it is my creed nevertheless we all know what's right but we don't always follow it the fact is i begin to think that it is absolutely necessary to fight the world with its own weapons i spoke to father mcgrath on the subject and he replied that if any one by doing wrong necessitated another to do wrong to circumvent him that the first party was answerable not only for his own sin but also for the sin committed in self-defence but o'brien i do not fix my faith so implicitly upon father mcgrath and i do not much admire many of his directions no more do i peter when i think upon them but how am i to puzzle my head upon these points all i know is that when you are divided between your inclination and your duty it's mighty convenient to have a priest like father mcgrath to decide for you and to look after your soul into the bargain it occurred to me that i myself when finding fault with o'brien had in the instance of both the letters from lord privilege been also guilty of deceit i was therefore blaming him for the same fault committed by myself and i am afraid that i was too ready in consoling myself with father mcgrath's maxim that one might do evil that good might come but to return to o'brien's interview after some little conversation the first lord said captain o'brien i am always very ready to oblige lord privilege and the more so 
as his recommendation is of an officer of your merit in a day or two if you will call at the admiralty you will hear further o'brien wrote to us immediately and we waited with impatience for his next letter but instead of this letter he made his appearance on the third day and first hugging me in his arms he then came to my sister embraced her and skipped and danced about the room what is the matter o'brien said i while ellen retreated in confusion o'brien pulled a parchment out of his pocket here peter my dear peter now for honour and glory an eighteen-gun brig peter the rattlesnake captain o'brien west india station by the holy father my heart's bursting with joy and down he sank into an easy chair ain't i almost beside myself inquired he after a short pause ellen thinks so i dare say replied i looking at my sister who stood in a corner of the room thinking o'brien was really out of his senses and still red with confusion o'brien who then called to mind what a slip of decorum he had been guilty of immediately rose and resuming his usual unsophisticated politeness as he walked up to my sister took her hand and said excuse me my dear miss ellen i must apologise for my rudeness but my delight was so great and my gratitude to your brother so intense that i am afraid that in my warmth i allowed the expressions of my feelings to extend to one so dear to him and so like him in person and in mind will you only consider that you received the overflowings of a grateful heart towards your brother and for his sake pardon my indiscretion ellen smiled and held out her hand to o'brien who led her to the sofa where he all three sat down and o'brien commenced a more intelligible narrative of what had passed he had called on the day appointed and sent up his card the first lord could not see him but referred him to the private secretary who presented him with his commission to the rattlesnake eighteen-gun brig the secretary smiled most graciously and told o'brien in confidence that he would proceed to the west india station as soon as his vessel was manned and ready for sea he inquired of o'brien whom he wished as his first lieutenant o'brien replied that he wished for me but as in all probability i should not be of sufficient standing be first lieutenant that the admiralty might appoint any other to the duty provided i joined the ship the secretary made a minute of o'brien's wish and requested him if he had a vacancy to spare as midshipman to allow him to send one on board to which o'brien willingly acceded shook hands with him and o'brien quitted the admiralty to hasten down to us with a pleasing intelligence and now said o'brien i have made up my mind how to proceed i shall first run down to plymouth and hoist my pennant then i shall ask for a fortnight's leave and go to ireland to see how they get on and what father mcgrath may be about so peter let's pass this evening as happily as we can for though you and i shall soon meet again yet it may be years or perhaps never that we three shall sit down on the same sofa as we do now ellen who was still nervous from the late death of her mother looked down and i perceived the tears start in her eyes at the remark of o'brien that perhaps we should never meet again and i did pass a happy evening my father dined out and did not interrupt us i had a dear sister on one side of me and a sincere friend on the other how few situations more enviable o'brien left us early the next morning and at breakfast time a letter was handed to my father it was from my uncle coldly communicating to him that lord privilege had died the night before very suddenly and informing him that the burial would take place on that day week 
and that the will would be opened immediately after the funeral my father handed the letter over to me without saying a word and sipped his tea with his teaspoon i cannot say that i felt very much on the occasion but i did feel because he had been kind to me at one time as to my father's feelings i could not or rather i should say i did not wish to analyse them as soon as he had finished his cup of tea he left the breakfast table and went into his study i then communicated the intelligence to my sister ellen my god said she after a pause putting her hand up to her eyes what a strange and natural state of society must we have arrived at when my father can thus receive the intelligence of a parent's death is it not dreadful it is my dearest girl replied i but every feeling has been sacrificed to worldly considerations and an empty name the younger sons have been neglected if not deserted virtue talent everything set at naught intrinsic value despised and the only claim to consideration admitted that have been the heir entail when all the ties of nature are cast loose by the parents can you be surprised if the children are no longer bound by them most truly you deserve that it is a detestable state of society i did not say detestable brother i said strange and unnatural had you said what i said ellen you would not have been wrong i would not for the title and wealth which it brings with the heartless isolated i may be neglected being that my grandfather was were it offered now i would not barter for it ellen's love ellen threw herself in my arms we then walked into the garden where we had a long conversation relative to our future wishes hopes and prospects end of chapter forty chapter forty one of peter simple this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott Chapter 41 Pompous Obsequies The Reading of the Will Not Exactly After Wilkie I Am Left a Legacy What Becomes of It my father very warm writes a sermon to cool himself i join o'brien's brig and fall in with swinburne on that day week i accompanied my father to eagle park to assist at the burial of lord privilege we were ushered into the room where the body had lain in state for three days the black hangings the lofty plumes the rich ornaments on the coffin and the number of wax candles with which the room was lighted produced a solemn and grand effect i could not help as i leaned against the balustrade before the coffin and thought of its contents calling to mind when my poor grandfather's feelings seemed as it were inclined to thaw in my favour when he called me his child and in all probability had not my uncle had a son would have died in my arms fond and attached to me for my own sake, independently of worldly considerations. I felt that had I known him longer, I could have loved him, and that he would have loved me. And I thought to myself how little all these empty honours, after his decease, could compensate for the loss of those reciprocal feelings, which would have so added to his happiness during his existence. But he had lived for pomp and vanity, and pomp and vanity attended him to his grave i thought of my sister ellen and of o'brien and walked away with the conviction that peter simple might have been an object of envy to the late right honourable lord viscount privilege baron Corston, lord lieutenant of the county and one of his majesty's most honourable privy councillors when the funeral which was very tedious and very splendid was over 
we all returned in the carriages to Eagle Park, when my uncle, who had of course assumed the title, and who had attended as chief mourner, was in waiting to receive us. We were shown into the library, and in the chair so lately and constantly occupied by my grandfather, sat the new lord. Near to him were the lawyers, with parchments lying before them. As we severally entered, he waved his hand to unoccupied chairs, intimating to us to sit down. But no words were exchanged, except an occasional whisper between him and the lawyers. When all the branches of the family were present, down to the fourth and fifth cousins, the lawyer on the right of my uncle put on his spectacles, and unrolling the parchment, commenced reading the will. I paid attention to it at first, but the legal technicalities puzzled me, and I was soon thinking of other matters, until, after half an hour's reading, I was startled at the sound of my own name. It was a bequest by codicil to me of the sum of ten thousand pounds. My father, who sat by me, gave me a slight push to attract my attention, and I perceived that his face was not quite so mournful as before. I was rejoicing at this unexpected intelligence. I called to mind what my father had said to me when we were returning from Eagle Park, that my grandfather's attentions to me were as good as ten thousand pounds in his will, and was reflecting how strange it was that he had hit upon the exact sum. I also thought of what my father had said of his own affairs, and his not having saved anything for his children, and congratulated myself that I should now be able to support my dear sister Ellen, in case of any accident happening to my father, when I was roused by another mention of my name. It was a codicil dated about a week back, in which my grandfather, not pleased at my conduct, revoked the former codicil, and left me nothing. I knew where the blow came from, and I looked my uncle in the face. A gleam of malignant pleasure was in his eyes, which had been fixed on me, waiting to receive my glance. I returned it with a smile expressive of scorn and contempt, and then looked at my father, who appeared to be in a state of misery. His head had fallen upon his breast, and his hands were clasped. Although I was shocked at the blow, for I knew how much the money was required, I felt too proud to show it. Indeed, I felt that I would not for worlds have exchanged situations with my uncle, much less feelings. For when those who remain meet to ascertain the disposition made by one who is summoned away to the tribunal of his maker, of those worldly and perishable things which he must leave behind him, feelings of rancour and ill-will might, for the time, be permitted to subside, and the memory of a departed brother be productive of charity and goodwill. After a little reflection, I felt that I could forgive my uncle. Not so my father. The codicil which deprived me of my inheritance was the last of the will, and the lawyer rolled up the parchment and took off his spectacles. Everybody rose. My father seized his hat, and telling me in a harsh voice to follow him, tore off the crepe weepers, and then threw them on the floor as he walked away. I also took off mine, and laid them on the table, and followed him. My father called his carriage, waiting in the hall till it was driven up, and jumped into it. I followed him. He drew up the blind, and desired them to drive home. Not a sixpence! By the God of heaven, not a sixpence! My name not even mentioned, except for a paltry mourning ring. And yours? Pray, sir, what have you been about? After having such a sum left you, to forfeit your grandfather's good opinion. Hey, sir, tell me directly, continued he, turning round to me in a rage. Nothing, my dear father, that I am aware of. My uncle is evidently my enemy. And why should he be particularly your enemy? Peter, there must be some reason, 
for his having induced your grandfather to alter his bequest in your favour i insist upon it sir that you tell me immediately my dear father when you are more calm i will talk this matter over with you i hope i shall not be considered wanting in respect when i say that as a clergyman of the church of england damn the church of england and those who put me into it replied my father maddened with rage i was shocked and held my tongue my father appeared also to be confused at his hasty expressions he sank back in his carriage and preserved a gloomy silence until we arrived at our own door as soon as we entered my father hastened to his own room and i went up to my sister ellen who was in her bedroom i revealed to her all that had passed and advised with her on the propriety of my communicating to my father the reasons which had occasioned my uncle's extreme aversion towards me after much argument she agreed with me that the disclosure had now become necessary after the dinner cloth had been removed my sister left the room and went upstairs and i then communicated to my father the circumstances which had come to our knowledge relative to my uncle's establishment in ireland he heard me very attentively took out tablets and made notes well peter said he after a few minutes silence when i had finished i see clearly through this whole business i have no doubt but that a child has been substituted to defraud you and me of our just inheritance of the title and estates but i will now set to work and try if i cannot find out the secret and with the help of captain o'brien and father mcgrath i think it is not at all impossible o'brien will do all that he can sir replied i and i expect soon to hear from him he must have now been a week in ireland i shall go there myself replied my father and there are no means that i will not resort to to discover this infamous plot no exclaimed he striking his fist on the table so as to shiver two of the wine glasses into fragments no means but i will resort to that is replied i my dear father no means which may be legitimately employed by one of your profession i tell you no means that can be used by man to recover his defrauded rights tell me not of legitimate means when i am to lose a title and property by a spurious and illegitimate substitution by the god of heaven i will meet them with fraud for fraud with false swearing for false swearing and with blood for blood if it should be necessary my brother has dissolved all ties and i will have my right even if i demand it with a pistol at his ear for heaven's sake my dear father do not be so violent recollect your profession i do replied he bitterly and how i was forced into it against my will i recollect my father's words the solemn coolness with which he told me i had my choice of the church or to starve but i have my sermon to prepare for to-morrow and i can sit here no longer tell ellen to send me in some tea i did not think my father was in a very fit state of mind to write a sermon but i held my tongue my sister joined me and we saw no more of him until breakfast the next day before we met i received a letter from o'brien my dear peter i ran down to plymouth hoisted my pennant drew my jollies from the dockyard and set my first lieutenant to work getting in the ballast and water tanks i then set off for ireland and was very well received as captain o'brien by my family who were all flourishing now that my two sisters are so well married off my father and mother are very comfortable but very lonely for i believe i told you long before that it had pleased heaven to take all the rest of my brothers and sisters except the two now married and one who bore up for a nunnery dedicating her service to god after she was scarred with the smallpox and no man would look at her ever since the family have been grown up my father and mother have been lamenting and sorrowing that none of them would go off and now that they are all gone off one way or another 
they cry all day because they are left all alone with no one to keep company with them except father mcgrath and the pigs we never are to be contented in this world that's sartin and now that they are comfortable in every respect they find that they are very uncomfortable and having obtained all their wishes they wish everything back again but as old maddox used to say a good growl is better than a bad dinner with some people and the greatest pleasure that they now have is to grumble and if that makes them happy they must be happy all day long for the devil a bit do they leave off from morning till night the first thing that i did was to send for father mcgrath who had been more away from home than usual i presume not finding things quite so comfortable as they used to be he told me that he had met with father o'toole and had a bit of a dialogue with him which had ended in a bit of a row and that he had cudgelled father o'toole well and tore his gown off his back and then tore it into shivers that father o'toole had referred the case to the bishop and that was how the matter stood just then but says he the spalpeen has left this part of the country and what is more has taken ella and her mother with him and what is still worse no one could find out where they were gone but it was believed that they had all been sent over the water so you see peter that this is a bad job in one point which is that we have no chance of getting the truth out of the old woman for now that we have war with france who is to follow them on the other hand it is good news for it prevents me from decoying that poor young girl and making her believe what will never come to pass and i'm not a little glad on that score for father mcgrath was told by those who were about her that she did nothing but weep and moan for two days before she went away scolded as she was by her mother and threatened by that blackguard o'toole it appears to me that all our hopes now are in finding out the soldier and his wife the wet nurse who were sent to india no doubt with the hope that the climate and the fevers may carry them off that uncle of yours is a great blackguard every bit of him i shall leave here in three days and you must join me at plymouth make my compliments to your father and my regards to your sister whom may all the saints preserve god bless her for ever and ever amen yours ever terence o'brien i put this letter into my father's hands when he came out of his room this is a deep laid plot said he and i think we must immediately do as o'brien states look after the nurse who was sent to india do you know the regiment to which her husband belongs yes sir replied i it is the thirty-third and she sailed for india about three months back the name you say i think is o'sullivan said he pulling out his tablets well i will write immediately to captain fielding and beg him to make the minutest inquiries i will also write to your sister lucy for women are much keener than men in affairs of this sort if the regiment is ordered to salon all the better if not he must obtain furlough to prosecute his inquiries when that is done i will go myself to ireland and try if we cannot trace the other parties my father then left the room and i retired with ellen to make preparations for joining my ship at plymouth a letter announcing my appointment had come down and i had written to request my commission to be forwarded to the clerk of the cheque at plymouth that i might save a useless journey to london on the following day i parted with my father and my dear sister and without any adventure arrived at plymouth dock where i met with o'brien the same day i reported myself to the admiral and joined my brig which was lying alongside the hulk with her topmasts pointed through returning from the brig as i was walking up four street i observed a fine stout sailor whose back was turned to me reading the handbill which had been posted up everywhere announcing that the rattlesnake captain o'brien about to proceed to the west india station where doubloons were so plentiful that dollars were only used for ballast was in want of a few stout hands it might have been said of a great many for we had not entered six men and were doing all the work with the marines and riggers of the dockyard 
but it is not the custom to show your poverty in this world, either with regard to men or money. I stopped and overheard him say, Aye, as for the doubloons, that cock won't fight. I've served long enough in the West Indies not to be humbugged. But I wonder whether Captain O'Brien was the second lieutenant of the Sanglia. If so, I shouldn't mind trying a cruise with him. I thought that I recollected the voice, and touching him on the shoulder, he turned round, and it proved to be Swinburne. What, Swinburne, said I, shaking him by the hand, for I was delighted to see him. Is it you? Why, Mr. Simple, well then, I expect that I'm right, and that Mr. O'Brien is made, and commands this craft. When you meet the pilot fish, the shark ain't far off, you know. You're very right, Swinburne, said I, in all except calling Captain O'Brien a shark. He's no shark. No, that he ain't except in one way, that is, that I expect he'll soon show his teeth to the Frenchman. But I beg your pardon, sir. And Swinburne took off his hat. Oh, I understand. You did not perceive before that I had shipped the swab. Yes, I'm Lieutenant of the Rattlesnake, Swinburne, and hope you'll join us. There's my hand upon it, Mr. Simple, said he, smacking his great fist into mine so as to make it tingle. I'm content if I know the captain's a good officer, but when there's two, I think myself lucky. I'll just take a boat and put my name on the books, and then I'll be on shore again to spend the rest of my money and try if I can't pick up a few hands as volunteers, for I know where they all be stowed away. I was looking at the craft this morning and rather took a fancy to her. She has a damn pretty run, but I hope Captain O'Brien will take off a fiddlehead and get one carved. I never knew a vessel do much with a fiddlehead. I rather think that Captain O'Brien has already applied to the commissioner on the subject, replied I. At all events, it won't be very difficult to make the alteration ourselves. To be sure not, replied Swinburne. A coil of four inch will make the body of the snake. I can carve out the head, and as for a rattle, be blessed if I don't rob one of those beggars of watchmen this very night. So good-bye, Mr. Simple, till we meet again. Swinburne kept his word. He joined the ship that afternoon, and the next day came off with six good hands, who had been induced from his representations to join the brig. Tell Captain O'Brien, said he to me, not to be in too great a hurry to man his ship. I know where there are plenty to be had, but I'll try fair means first. This he did, and every day almost he brought off a man, and all he did bring off were good, able seamen. Others volunteered, and we were now more than half manned and ready for sea. The Admiral then gave us permission to send press gangs on shore. Mr. Simple, said Swinburne, I've tried all I can to persuade a lot of fine chaps to enter, but they won't. Now that I'm resolved that my brig shall be well manned, and if they don't know what's good for them, I do, and I'm sure that they'll thank me for it afterwards, so I'm determined to take every mother's son of them. The same night we mustered all Swinburne's men and went on shore to a crimp's house which they knew, surrounded it with our marines in blue jackets, and took out of it twenty-three fine, able seamen, which nearly filled up our complement. The remainder we obtained by a draft from the Admiral's ship, and I do not believe that there was a vessel that left Plymouth Harbour and anchored in the Sound, better manned than the Rattlesnake. So much for a good character, which is never lost upon seamen. O'Brien was universally liked by those who had sailed with him, and Swinburne, who knew him well, persuaded many, and forced the others, to enter with him, whether they liked it or not. This they in the event did, and with the exception of those drafted from the flagship, we had no desertions. Indeed, none deserted whom we could have wished to retain, and their vacancies were soon filled up with better men. End of chapter 41《ハッピーリトルプレゼント》ハッピーリトルプレゼント。ハッピーリトルプレゼント。ハッピーリトルプレゼント。
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. Chapter 42 of Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott we sailed for the west indies a volunteer for the ship refused and sent on shore again for reasons which the chapter will satisfactorily explain to the reader we were very glad when the master attendant came on board to take us into the sound and still more glad to perceive that the brig which had just been launched before o'brien was appointed to her appeared to sail very fast as she ran out so approved after we went to sea she sailed wonderfully well beating every vessel that she met and overhauling in a very short time everything that we chased turning to windward like magic and tracking in a moment three days after we anchored in the sound the ship's company were paid and our sailing orders came down to proceed with dispatches by next evening's post to the island of jamaica we started with a fair wind and were soon clear of the channel our whole time was now occupied in training our new ship's company at the guns and teaching them to pull together and by the time that we had run down the trades we were in a very fair state of discipline the first lieutenant was rather an odd character his brother was a sporting man of large property and he had contracted from his example a great partiality for such pursuits he knew the winning horses of the derby and the oaks for twenty years back was an adept at all athletic exercises a capital shot and had his pointer on board in other respects he was a great dandy in person always wore gloves even on service very gentlemanlike and handsome and not a very bad sailor that is he knew enough to carry on his duty very credibly and evidently now that he was the first lieutenant and obliged to work learnt more of his duty every day i never met a more pleasant messmate or a more honourable young man a brig is only allowed two lieutenants the master was a rough kind-hearted intelligent young man always in good humour the surgeon and purser completed our mess they were men of no character at all except perhaps that the surgeon was too much of a courtier and the pursuer of too much of a skin flint but pursuers are generally speaking more sinned against than sinning but i have been led away while talking of the brig and the officers and had almost forgotten to narrate a circumstance which occurred two days before we sailed i was with o'brien in the cabin when mr osblandestone the first lieutenant came in and reported that the boy had come on board to volunteer for the ship what sort of lad is he said o'brien a very nice lad very slight sir replied the first lieutenant we have two vacancies well see what you make of him and if you think he will do you may put him on the books i have tried him sir he says that he has been a very short time at sea i made him mount the main rigging but he did not like it much well do as you please osbaldistone replied o'brien and the first lieutenant quitted the cabin in about a quarter of an hour he returned if you please sir said he laughing i sent the boy down to the surgeon to be examined and he refused to strip the surgeon says that he thinks she is a woman i have had her up to the quarter-deck and she refused to answer any questions and requires to speak with you with me said o'brien with surprise oh one of the men's wives i suppose trying to steal a march upon us we'll send her down here as baldestone and i'll prove to her that the moral impossibility of her sailing in his majesty's brig rattlesnake in a few minutes the first lieutenant sent her down to the cabin door and i was about to retire as she entered but o'brien stopped me stay peter my reputation will be at stake if i'm left all alone said he laughing the sentry opened the door and whether a boy or girl a more interesting face i never beheld but the hair was cut close like a boy's and i could not tell whether the surgeon's suspicions were correct you wish to speak holy st patrick cried o'brien looking earnestly at her features and o'brien covered his face and bent over the table exclaiming my god my god in the meantime the colour of the young person fled from her countenance and then rushed into it again alternatively leaving it pale and suffused with blushes i perceived the trembling over the frame the knees shook and locked together and i had not hastened she for a female it was would have fallen on the deck i perceived that she had fainted i therefore laid her down on the deck and hastened to obtain some water o'brien ran up and went to her my poor girl my poor girl said he sorrowfully oh peter this is all your fault all my fault how could she have come here by all the saints who pray for us dearly as i prize them i would give up my ship and my commission that this could be undone 
as o'brien hung over her the tears from his eyes fell upon her face while i bathed it with water i had brought from the dressing-room i knew who it must be although i had never seen her it was the girl whom o'brien had professed love to worm out of the secret of the exchange of my uncle's child and as i beheld the scene i could not help saying to myself who now will assert this evil that may be done that good may come the poor girl showed symptoms of recovering and o'brien waved his hand to me saying leave us peter and see that no one comes in i remained nearly an hour at the cabin door by the sentry and prevented many from entering when o'brien opened the door and requested me to order his gig to be manned and then come in the poor girl had evidently been weeping bitterly and o'brien was much affected all is arranged peter you must go on shore with her and not leave her till you see her safe off by the night coach do me that favour peter you ought indeed continued he in a low voice for you have been partly the occasion of this i shook o'brien's hand and made no answer the boat was reported ready and the girl followed me with a firm step i pulled on shore saw her safe in the coach without asking her any question and then returned on board come on board sir said i entering the cabin with my hat in my hand and reporting myself according to the regulations of the service thank you replied o'brien shut the door peter tell me how did she behave what did she say she never spoke and i never asked her a question she seemed to be willing to do as you had arranged sit down peter i never felt more unhappy or disgusted with myself in all my life i feel as i could never be happy again a sailor's life mixes him up with the worst part of the female sex and we do not know the real value of the better i little thought when i was talking nonsense to the poor girl that i was breaking one of the kindest hearts in the world and sacrificing the happiness of one who would lay down her existence for me peter since you have been gone it's twenty times that i've looked in the glass just to see whether i don't look like a villain but by the blood of st patrick i thought woman's love was just like our own and that a three months's cruise would set all to rights again i thought she had gone over to france so did i but now she has told me all about it father o'toole and her mother brought her down to the coast near here to embark in a smuggling boat for dieppe when the boat pulled in shore in the night to take them in the mother and the rascally priest got in but she felt as if it were leaving the whole world to leave the country i was in and she held back the officers came down one or two pistols were fired the boat shoved off without her and she with their luggage was left on the beach she went back to the next town with the officers where she told the truth of the story and they let her go in father o'toole's luggage she found letters which she read and found out that she and her mother were to have been placed in a convent at dieppe and as the convent was named in the letters which she says are important but i have not had courage to read them yet she went to the people from whose house they had embarked requesting them to forward the luggage and a letter to her mother sending everything but the letters which she reserved for me she was since received a letter from her mother telling her that she is safe and well in the convent and begging her to come over to her as soon as possible the mother took the vows a week after she arrived there so we know where to find her peter and where is this poor girl going to stay now o'brien well that's the worst part of it it appears to me that she hoped not to be found out till after we sailed and then to have as she said poor thing to have laid at my feet and watched over me in the storms but i pointed out to her that it was not permitted and could not be and that i would not be allowed to marry her oh peter this is a very sad business continued o'brien passing his hand across his eyes well but o'brien what is to become of the poor girl she is going to be home with my father and mother hoping one day that i shall come back and marry her i have written to father mcgrath to see what he can do have you not undeceived her father mcgrath must do that i could not it would have been the death of her it would have stabbed her to the heart and it's not for me to give that blow i'd sooner have died sooner have married her than have done it peter perhaps when i'm far away she'll bear it better father mcgrath will manage it o'brien i don't like that father mcgrath well peter you may be right i don't exactly like all he says myself 
but what is a man to do? Either he is a Catholic, and believes as a Catholic, or he is not one. Will I abandon my religion, now that it is persecuted? Never, Peter. I hope not, without I find much better at all events. Still, I do not like to feel that this advice of my confessor is at variance with my own conscience. Father McGrath is a worldly man, but not only provokes that he is wrong, not that our religion is, and I don't mind speaking to you on this subject. No one knows that I am a Catholic except yourself, and at the Admiralty they never asked me to take that oath which I never would have taken, although Father McGrath says I may take any oath I please with what he calls heretics, and he will grant me absolution. Peter, my dear fellow, say no more about it. I did not, but I may as well end the history of poor Ella Flangen at once, as she will not appear again. About three months afterwards, we received a letter from Father McGrath stating that the girl had arrived safe and had been a great comfort to O'Brien's father and mother, who wished her to remain with them altogether. That Father McGrath had told her that when a man took his commission as captain, it was all the same as going into a monastery as a monk, for he never could marry. The poor girl believed him, and thinking that O'Brien was lost to her forever with the advice of Father McGrath, had entered as a nun in one of the religious houses in Ireland, that, as she said, she might pray for him night and day. Many years afterwards we heard of her. She was well and not unhappy, but O'Brien never forgot his behavior to this poor girl. It was a source of continual regret, and I believe, until the vast day of his existence, his heart smote him for his inconsiderate conduct towards her. But I must leave this distressing topic and return to the rattlesnake, which had now arrived at the West Indies and joined the Admiral at Jamaica. End of chapter 42「Chapter forty three of Peter Simple This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter forty three. Description of the coast of Martinique. Popped at for peeping. No heroism in making oneself a target. Board a miniature Noah's Ark under Yankee colors. Capture a French slaver. Parrot soup in Leo of Mock Turtle. We found orders at Barbados to cruise off Martinique to prevent supplies being furnished to the garrison of the island, and we proceeded there immediately. I do not know anything more picturesque than running down the east side of this beautiful island, the ridges of hills spreading down to the water's edge, covered with the freshest verdure, divided at the base by small bays with the beach of dazzling white sand, and where the little coasting vessels, employed to bring the sugar from the neighboring estates, were riding at an anchor. Each hill at its adjutment towards the sea was crowned with a fort of which waves the tricolor, certainly in appearance, one of the most warlike flags in the world. On the third morning we had rounded the diamond rock and were scuttling along the lee side of the island, just opening Fort Royal Bay, when, hauling rather too close round its eastern entrance formed by a promontory called Solomon's Point, which was covered with brushwood, we found ourselves nearer than agreeable to the newly constructed battery. A column of smoke was poured along the blue water, and it was followed by the whizzing of a shot which passed through our boom mainsail, first cutting away the dog vane which was close to our old Swineburne's head, as he was on the corrode conning the brig. I was at dinner in the cabin with O'Brien and the first lieutenant. "'Where the devil have they got the brig now?' said O'Brien, rising from his chair and going on deck. We both followed, but before we were on deck, three or four more shots passed between the mast. "'If you please, sir,' said the master's mate in charge of the deck, whose name was O'Farrell, "'the battery has opened upon us.' "'Thank you very much for your information, Mr. O'Farrell,' replied O'Brien. "'but the French have reported it before you. "'May I ask if you have any particular to fancy to be made a target of, "'or if you think that His Majesty's brig Rattlesnake "'was sent here to be riddled for nothing at all? "'Starboard the helm, quartermaster!' "'The helm was put up, and the brig was soon run out of the fire. 
not however until a few more shots were pitched close to us and one carried away the fore topmast backstay no mr o'farrell replied o'brien i only wish to point out to you that i trust neither i nor any one on the ship cares a fig about the whizzing of a shot or two about our ears when there is anything to be gained for it either for ourselves or for our country but i do care a great deal about losing even the leg or the arm much more the life of any of the men when there is no occasion for it so in future recollect it's no disgrace to keep out of the way of a battery when all the advantage is on their side i've always observed that chance shots pick out the best men lower down the mainsail and send the sailmaker aft to repair it when brian returned to the cabin i remained on deck for it was my afternoon watch and although o'farrell had permission to look out for me i did not choose to go down again the bay of Fort Royal was now opened, and the view was extremely beautiful. Swinburne was still on the Courant, and as I knew he had been there before, I applied to him for information as to the locale. He told me the names of the batteries above the town, pointed out Fort Edward and Negro Point, and particularly Pigeon Island, the battery at the top of which wore the appearance of a mural crown. "'It's well I remember that place, Mr. Simple,' said he it was ninety-four when i was last there the sodgers had sieged it for a whole month and we were about to give it up cause they couldn't get a gun up at that pointier hill you see over there so poor captain faulkner says there's many a clear head under a tarpaulin hat and i'll give any chap five doubloons that will hitch up a twenty-four pounder to the top of the hill not quite so easy as a matter as you may perceive from here mr simple it certainly appears to me to have been almost impossible swinburne replied i and so did it to most of us mr simple but there was one dick smith made of a transport who had come on shore and he steps out saying i've been looking at your men handling that gun and my opinion is that if you gets a butt crams in a courant well wold it up and fill it with old junk and europe yarns you may parbuckle it up to the very top so captain faulkner pulls out five doubloons and gives them to him saying you deserve the money for the hint even if it don't succeed but it did succeed mr simple and the next day to their surprise we opened fire on the french beggars and soon brought their boasting down one of the french officers after he was taken prisoner asked me how we had managed to get the gun up there but i wasn't going to blow the gaff so i told him a great secret that we got it up with a kite upon which we opened all his eyes and crying sacre bleu walked away believing all that i said was true but ain't that a sail we have opened with the point mr simple it was so and i reported it to o'brien who came up and gave chase in half an hour we were alongside of her when she hoisted american colors and proved to be brigantine laden up to her gunwale which had not a foot above the water her cargo consisted of what the american called notions that is in english an assorted cargo half way up her masts down to the deck were hung up baskets containing apples potatoes onions and nuts of various kinds her deck was crowded with cattle sheep pigs and donkeys below was full of shingle lumber and a variety of different articles too numerous to mention i boarded her and asked the master whither he was bound why replied he i'm bound for the market no eyes particular and i guess you won't stop me not if it's all right replied i but i must look at your log well i've a notion there's no great objection to that replied he and he brought it up on deck i had no great time to examine it but i could not help being amused that the little i did read such as horse latitudes water very short killed white-faced bullock caught in a dolphin and ate him for dinner broached molasses cask number one letter a fine night saw little round things floating on the water took up a bucketful guessed they were pearls judge i guess wrong only little portuguese men of war threw them overboard again heard a little scream guessed it was a mermaid looked out saw nothing witnessed a very strange rippling ahead calculated it must be the sea serpent stood on to see him plain and nearly ran on barbuda hauled off again met a britchner treated politely having overhauled his log i then begged to overhaul his men to ascertain if there were any englishmen among his crew this was not pleasing and he grumbled very much but they were ordered aft 
one man i was satisfied was an englishman and told him so but the man as well as his master persisted to the contrary nevertheless i resolved to take him on board for o'brien to decide and ordered him on to the boat well if you will use force i can't help it my deck ain't clear as you see or else i tell you what mr lieutenant your vessel there will be another hermione i've a notion if you press as true bloody yankees and what's more the states will take it up as sure as the snakes in virginia notwithstanding this remonstrance i took them on board to o'brien and had a long conversation with the american in the cabin when they returned on deck he was allowed to depart with his man and we again made sail i had the first watch that night and we ran along the coast i perceived a vessel under the high land in what the sailors called the doldrums and this is most becalmed or her sailors flapping in every direction with the eddying winds we steered for her and were very soon in the same situation not more than a quarter of a mile from her the quarter boat was lowered down and i proceeded to board her but as she was large and rakish o'brien desired me to be careful if there were the least show of resistance to return as i pulled up her bows they hailed me in french and desired me to keep off or they would fire this was quite sufficient and in obedience to my orders i returned to the brig and reported to o'brien we lowered down all the quarter boats and towed round the brig's broadside to her and gave her half a dozen carronades of round and grape here in great noise and confusion on board after we had ceased firing o'brien again sent me to know if they had surrendered they replied in the affirmative and i boarded her she proved to be the commence de bordeaux with three hundred and thirty slaves on board out of five hundred embarked from the coast bound to martinique the crew were very sickly and were most of them in their hammocks latterly they had been killing parrots to make soup for them a few that were left of the gray species smoke remarkably well when they left the coast they had nearly one thousand parrots on board o'brien perceiving that i had taken possession sent another boat to know what the vessel was i desired the surgeon to be sent on board as some of the men and many of the poor slaves were wounded by our shot of all the miserable objects i know of none to be compared to the poor devils of slaves on board of a slave vessel the state of suffocation between decks the dreadful stench arising from their filth which is hardly ever cleared away the sick lying without help and looked upon by those who are stronger with the utmost indifference men women and children all huddled and crowded together in a state of nudity worn to skin and bone from stench starvation and living in an atmosphere that none but a negro could exist in if all that occurs on a slave ship were really known i think it would be acknowledged that to make the slave trade piracy would be nothing more than a just retribution and this is certain that unless it be made piracy it will never be discontinued by daylight the vessel was ready and o'brien determined to take her to dominica so that the poor devils might be immediately set on shore we anchored with her in a few days in prince rupert's bay where we had only twenty-four hours to obtain some refreshments and arrange about our prize which i hardly need say was of some value during the short time that i was on shore purchasing some fowls and vegetables for o'brien and our own mess i was amused at witnessing a black sergeant drilling some of his regiment of free negroes and mulattoes he appeared resolved to make the best appearance that he could for he began by saying you have sure and talking stand in front you have sure no talking stand in centre you have sure no talking stand in rear face to mountain back to sea bench why do you tap out sir you hangman I was curious to count the numbers qualified for the front rank. There were only two mulattoes. In the second rank, there were also only two. No shoe and no talking appeared to be the fashion. As usual, we were surrounded by the negroes, and although we had been but a few hours, they were song compared to us, for they constantly repeated, Don't you see the rattlesnake coming under sail? Don't you see the rattlesnake with prizes at a tail? Rattlesnake have all the money. Ding, ding. She have all that's funny ding ding end of chapter forty three chapter forty four of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anthony gurgis peter simple by frederick marriott chapter forty four money can purchase anything in the new country 
American information not always to be dependent upon. A night attack, we are beaten off. It proves a cut-up instead of a cut-out. After all, we save something out of the fire. The next morning, we weighed anchor and returned to our station off Martinique. We had run within three miles of St. Pierre when we discovered a vessel coming out under jury masts. She steered directly for us, and we made her out to be the American brigantine, which we had boarded some time before. O'Brien sent a boat to bring the master of her on board. "'Well, Captain,' said he, "'so you met with a squall?' "'I calculate not,' replied he. "'Why, then, what the devil have you been about?' "'Why, I guess I sold all my cargo, and what's more, I've sold my masts.' "'Sold your masts? Whom did you sell them to?' to an almighty pretty French privateer lying in St. Pierre's, which had lost her spars when she had been chased out by one of your brass-bottomed sarpents, and I've a notion they paid pretty handsomely, too. But how do you mean to get home again? I calculate to get into the stream, and then I'll do very well. If I meet a Norwester, why then I'll make a signal of distress, and someone will tow me in, I guess. Well, replied O'Brien, but step down into the cabin and take something, Captain. With particular pleasure, replied the strange mortal, and down they went. In about half an hour they returned on deck, and the boat took the American on board. Soon afterwards, O'Brien desired Osbaldistone and myself to step down into the cabin. The chart of the harbor of St. Pierre lay on the table, and O'Brien said, I've had a long conversation with the American, and he states that the privateer is at anchor in this spot pointing to the pencil mark on the chart. If so, she is well out, and I see no difficulty in capturing her. You see that she lies in four fathoms water and so close under the outer battery that the guns could not be pointed down upon the boats. I have also inquired if they keep a good lookout, and the American says that they feel so secure that they keep no lookout at all, and the captain and officers belonging to her are on shore all night drinking, smoking, and boasting of what they will do. Now the question is whether this report be correct. The American has been well treated by us, and I see no reason to doubt him. Indeed, he gave the information voluntarily as if he wished to serve us. I allowed us Baldistone to speak first. He coincided with Brian. I did not. The very circumstance of her requiring new mass made me doubt the truth of his assertion as to where she lay, and if one part of her story was false, why not the whole? O'Brien appeared struck with my argument, and it was agreed that if the boats did not go away, it should be for a reconnaissance, and that the attempt should only be made, provided it was found that the privateer lay in the same spot pointed out by the American master. It was, however, decided that the reconnaissance should take place that very night, as allowing the privateer to be anchored on the spot supposed, there were every probability that she would not remain there, but haul further in to take in her new mats. The news that an expedition was at hand has soon circulated throughout the ship, and all the men had taken their cutlasses from the capistan to get ready for action. The fighting boats' crews, without orders, were busy with their boats, some cutting up old blankets to muffle the oars, others making new grummets. The ship's company were as busy as bees, bustling and buzzing about the decks, and reminding you of the agitation which takes place in a hive previous to a swarm. At last Osbaldistone came on deck and ordered the boats' crew to be piped away and prepare for service. I was to have the command of the expedition in the launch. I had charge of the first cutter, O'Farrell of the second, and Swinburne had the charge of the jolly boat. At dusk the head of the brig was again turned towards St. Pierre and we ran slowly in. At ten we hove to, and about eleven boats were ordered to haul up. O'Brien repeating his orders to Mr. Osbaldistone not to make the attempt if the privateer were found to be anchored close to the town. The men were all mustered on the quarter deck to ascertain if they had the distinguishing mark on their jackets, that is, square patches of canvas sewn on their left arm, so that we might recognize friend from foe, a very necessary precaution in a night expedition. And then they were manned and ordered to shove off. The oars were dropped in the water, throwing out a phosphorescent light so common in the climate, and away we went. After an hour's pulling, Osbaldistone lay on his oars in the launch, and we closed with him. We are now at the mouth of the harbor, said he, and the most perfect silence must be observed. At the mouth of the harbor, sir, said Swinburne, 
I reckon we are more than halfway in. We passed that point at least ten minutes ago, and this is the second battery. We are now abreast of. To this, Osbaldistone did not agree. Nor indeed did I think that Swinburne was right, but he persisted in it and pointed out to us the lights in the town, which were now all open to us and which would not be the case if we were only at the mouth of the harbour. Still, we were of a different opinion, and Swinburne, out of respect to his officers, said no more. We resumed our oars, pulling with the greatest caution. The night was intensely dark, and we could distinguish nothing. After about ten minutes more, we appeared to be close to the lights in the town. Still, we could see no privateer or any other vessels. Again we lay upon our oars and held a consultation. Swinburne declared that if the privateer lay where we were supposed, we had passed her long ago. But while we were debating, O'Farrell cried out, I see her, and he was right. She was not more than a cable's length from us. Without waiting for orders, O'Farrell desired his men to give away and dashed alongside of the privateer. Before we were halfway on board of her, lights flew about in every direction and a dozen muskets were discharged. We had nothing to do but follow him, and in a few seconds we were all alongside of her, but she was well prepared and on the alert. Boarding nettings were triced up all around. Every gun had been depressed as much as possible, and she appeared to be full of men. A scene of confusion and slaughter now occurred, which I trust never again to witness. All our attempts to get on board were unveiling. If we had tried at a port, a dozen pikes thrust us back. If we attempted the boarding nettings, we were thrown down, killed or wounded into the boats. From every port and from the decks of the privateer, the discharge of musketry was incessant. Pistols were protruded and fired in our faces, while occasionally her carronades went off, stunning us with their deafening noise, and rocking the boats in the disturbed water if they had no other effect. For ten minutes our exertions never ceased. At last, with half our numbers lying killed and wounded in the bottom of the boats, the men, worn out and dispirited at their unavailing attempts, sat down, most of them on the boats as thwarts, loading their muskets and discharging them into the ports. Osbaldistone was among the wounded, and perceiving that he was not in the launch of whose crew not six remained, I called to Swinburne, who alongside of me, and desired him to tell me the other boats to make the best of their way out of the harbour. This was soon communicated to the other survivors, who would have continued the unequal contest to the last man, if I had not given the order. The launch and second cutter shoved off, O'Farrell also having fallen, and as soon as they were clear of the privateer and had gotten their oars to pass, I proceeded to do the same. Amidst the shots and yells of the Frenchmen, who now jumped on their gunwale and pelted us with their musketry, cheering and mocking us. Stop, sir, cried Swinburne. We'll have a bit of revenge. So saying, he hauled to the launch, and wending her boat to the privateer, directed her carronade, which they had no idea that we had on board as we had not fired it to where the Frenchmen were crowded the thickest. Stop one moment, Swinburne. Put another dose of canister in. We did so, and then discharged the gun, which had the most murderous effect, bringing the major part of them down upon the deck. I feel convinced from the cries and groans which followed that if we had had a few more men, we might have returned and captured the privateer. But it was too late. The batteries were all lighted up, and although they could not see the boats fired in the direction where they supposed us to be, for they were awake from the shouting on board the vessel that we had been beaten off, the launch had but six hands capable of taking an oar. The first cutter had but four. In my own boat I had five. Swinburne had two besides himself in the jolly boat. "'This is a sorry business, sir,' said Swinburne. "'Now what's best to be done?' My idea is that we had better put all the wounded men into the launch, man the two cutters in jolly boat, and tow her off. And, Mr. Simple, instead of keeping on this side, as they will expect us in the batteries, let us keep close in shore, upon the near side, and their shot will pass over us. The advice was too good not to be followed. It was now two o'clock, and we had a long pull before us, and no time to lose. We lifted the dead bodies and the wounded men out of the two cutters and the jolly boat into the launch. I had no time for examination, but I perceived that O'Farrell was quite dead, and also a youngster of the name of Pepper, who must have smuggled himself into the boats. I did, however, look for Esbaldistone, and found him in the stern sheets of the launch. He had received a deep wound in the breast, apparently with a pike. 
he was sensible and asked me for a little water which i procured from the beaker which was left in the launch and gave it to him at the word water and hearing it poured out from the beaker many of the wounded men faintly called out for some having no time to spare i left two men in the launch one to steer and the other to give them water and then taking her in tow pulled directly in for the batteries as advised by swinburne who now sat alongside of me as soon as we were well in shore i pulled out of the harbour with feelings not by any means enviable swinburne said to me in a low voice this will be a hard blow for the captain mr simple i've always been told that a young captain losing his men without bringing any dollars to his admiral is not very well received i am more sorry for him than i can well express swinburne replied i but what is that ahead a vessel under way swinburne stood up in the end of the cutter and looked for a few seconds yes a large ship standing in the royals she must be a frenchman now's our time sir so long as we don't go out empty-handed all will be well oars all of you shall we cast off by the launch sir yes replied i and now my lads let us only have that vessel and we shall do she is a merchantman that is clear not that i was sure of it swinburne i think it will be better to let her pass in shore they will all be looking out of the other side for they must have seen the firing well thought of sir replied swinburne we lay on our oars and let her pass us which she did creeping in at a rate of two miles an hour we then pulled for her quarter in the three boats leaving the launch behind us and boarded as we premised the crew were on deck and all on the other side of the vessel so anxiously looking out at the batteries which were still firing occasional random shot that they did not perceive us until we were close to them and then they had no time to seize their arms there were several ladies on board some of the people protected them others ran below in two minutes we had possession of her and had put her head in the other way to our surprise we found that she mounted fourteen guns one hatch we left open for the ladies some of whom had fainted to be taken down below the others were fastened down by swinburne as soon as we had the deck to ourselves we manned one of the cutters and sent it for the launch and as soon as we had made fast alongside we had time to look about us the breeze freshened and in half an hour we were out of gunshot of all the batteries i then had the wounded men taken out of the launch and swinburne and the other men bound up their wounds and made them as comfortable as they could End of chapter 44 chapter 45 of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Anthony Gerges. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Forty Five. Some remarkable occurrences take place in the letter of Mark. Old friends with improved faces. The captor a captive, but not carried away. Though the captive is by the ship's boat. The whole chapter a mixture of love, war, and merchandise we had had possession of the vessel about an hour when the man who was sentry over the hatchway told me that one of the prisoners wished to speak with the english commanding officer and asked leave to come on deck i gave permission and a gentleman came up stating that he was a passenger that the ship was a letter of mark from the bordeaux and that there were seven lady passengers on board who had come out to join their husbands and families and that he trusted i would have no objection to put them on shore as women could hardly be considered as objects of warfare as i knew that o'brien would have done so and that he would be glad to get rid of both women and prisoners if he could i replied most certainly that i would heave to that they might not have so far to pull on shore and that i would permit the ladies and other passengers to go on shore i begged that they would be as quick as possible in getting their packages ready and that i would give them two of the boats belonging to the ship with a sufficient number of french seamen belonging to her to man the boats the frenchman was grateful thanked me in the name of the ladies and went down below to impart the intelligence i then hove to lowered down the boats from the quarters and waited for them to come up it was daylight before they were ready but that i did not care about i saw the brig in the offing about seven miles off and i was well clear of the batteries at last they made their appearance one by one coming up the ladder escorted by french gentlemen 
they had to wait while the packages and bundles were put into the boats the first sight which struck them with horror was the many dead and wounded englishmen lying on the decks expressing their commiseration i told them that we had attempted to take the privateer and had been repulsed and that it was coming out of the harbour that i had fallen in with their ship and captured it all the ladies had severally thanked me for my kindness in giving me their liberty except one whose eyes were fixed upon the wounded men when the french gentleman went up to her and reminded her that she had not expressed her thanks to the commanding officer she turned round to me i stared back i certainly had seen that face before i could not be mistaken yet she had now grown up into a beautiful young woman celeste said i trembling are you not celeste yes replied she looking earnestly at me as if she would discover who i was but which it was not very easy to do begrimed as my face was with dust and gunpowder have you forgotten peter simple oh no no never forget you cried celeste bursting into tears and holding out her hands this scene occasioned no small astonishment to the parties on deck who could not comprehend it she smiled through her tears as i told her how happy i was to have the means of being of service to her and where is the colonel said i there replied she pointing to the island he is now general and commands the force in the garrison and where is mr o'brien interrogated celeste there replied i he commands that man of war of which i am the second lieutenant a rapid exchange of inquiries took place and the boats were stopped while we were in conversation swinburne reported that the brig was standing in for us and i felt that in justice to the wounded i could no longer delay still i found time to press her hand and to thank her for the purse that she had given me when i was on the stilts and to tell her that i had never forgotten her and never would with many remembrances to her father i was handing her into the boat when she said i don't know whether i'm right to ask it but could you do me such a favour what is it celeste you have allowed more than one half of the men to pull us on shore some must remain and they are so miserable indeed it is hardly yet decided which of them are to go could you let them all go that i will for your sake celeste as soon as your two boats have shoved off i will lower the boat astern and send the rest after you but i must make sail now god bless you the boats then shoved off the passengers waving their handkerchiefs to us and i made sail for the brig as soon as the stern boat was alongside the rest of the crew were called up and put into her and followed their companions i felt that o'brien would not be angry with me for letting them all go and especially when i told him who begged for them the vessel's name was the victorine mounting fourteen guns and twenty-four men with eleven passengers she was chiefly laden with silks and wine and was a very valuable prize celeste had time to tell me that her father had been four years in martinique and had left her at home for her education and that she was then coming out to join him the other ladies were all wives or daughters of officers of the french garrison on the island and the gentlemen passengers were some of them french officers but as this was told to me in secret of course i was not bound to know it as they were not in uniform as soon as we had closed with the brig i hastened on board to o'brien and as soon as a fresh supply of hands to man the boat and the surgeon and his assistant had been dispatched on board of the prize to superintend the removal of the wounded i went down with him into the cabin and narrated what had occurred well said o'brien all's well that ends well but this is not the luckiest hit in the world your taking the ship has saved me peter and i must make as flourishing a dispatch as i can by the powers but it's very lucky that she has fourteen guns it sounds grand i must muddle it all up together so that the admiral must think that we intended to cut them both out and so we did sure enough if we had known she had been there but i am most anxious to hear the surgeon's report and whether poor osbaldistone will do well peter oblige me by going on board and put two marines sentry over the hatchway so that no one goes down and pulls the traps about for i will send on shore everything belonging to the passengers for colonel o'brien's sake the surgeon's report was made six killed and sixteen wounded 
the killed were o'farrell pepper midshipsmen two seamen and two marines the first lieutenant osbaldistone was severely wounded in three places but likely to do well five other men were dangerously wounded the other ten would in all probability return to their duty in less than a month as soon as the wounded were on board o'brien returned with me to the prize and we went down into the cabin all the passengers' effects were collected the trunks which had been left open were nailed down and o'brien wrote a handsome letter to general o'brien containing a list of the packages sent on shore we sent the launch with a flag of truce to the nearest battery after some demur it was accepted and the effects landed we did not wait for an answer but made all sail to join the admiral in barbados the next morning we buried those who had fallen o'farrell was a fine young man brave as a lion but very hot in his temper he would have made a good officer had he been spared poor little pepper was also much regretted he was but twelve years old he had bribed the bowman of the second cutter to allow him to conceal himself under the foresheets of the boat his day's allowance of spirits had purchased him this object of his ambition which ended so fatally but as soon as the bodies had disappeared under the wave and the service was over we all felt happier there is something very unpleasant particularly to sailors to have a corpse on board we now sailed merrily along the prize keeping company with us and before we reached barbados most of the men were convalescent as baldistone's wounds were however very severe and he was recommended to return home which he did and obtained his promotion as soon as he arrived he was a pleasant messmate and i was sorry to lose him although the lieutenant appointed to his room being junior to me i was promoted to be first lieutenant of the brig soon after osbaldistone went home his brother broke his neck when hunting and osbaldistone came into the property he then quitted the service we found the admiral at barbados who received o'brien and his dispatch very well o'brien had taken two good prizes and that was sufficient to cover a multitude of sins even if he had committed any but the dispatch was admirably written and the admirable in his letter to the admiralty commended upon captain o'brien's successful and daring attack at the real truth of these sort of things whereas if the truth had been known it was swinburne's advice of pulling up the weather ashore which was the occasion of our capturing the victorine but it was very hard to come at the real truth of these sort of things as i found out during the time that i was in his majesty's service End of chapter 45、chapter、46 of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 46 O'Brien tells his crew that one Englishman is as good as three Frenchmen on salt water. They prove it. We fall in with an old acquaintance, although she could not be considered as a friend. Our next cruise was on the coast of Guinea and Gulf of Mexico, where we were running up and down for three months without falling in with anything but West India men bound to Demera, Berbice, and Suriname and occasionally chasing a privateer. But, in the light winds, they were too fast for us. Still, we were useful in protecting the trade, and O'Brien had a letter of thanks from the merchants, and a handsome piece of plate upon his quitting the station. We had made sail for Barbados two days, and were within sight of the island of Trinidad, when we perceived six sails on the lee bow, we soon made them out to be three large ships and three schooners, and immediately guessed, which afterwards proved to be correct, that they were three privateers with West India ships which they had captured. We made all sail, and at first the three privateers did the same, but afterwards, having made out our force and not liking to abandon their prizes, they resolved to fight. The West India men hauled to the wind on the other tack, and the three privateers shortened sail and awaited our coming. We beat to quarters, 
and when everything was ready and we were within a mile of, of the enemy, who had now thrown out the tricolored flag, O'Brien ordered all the men aft on the quarter-deck and addressed them. Now, my men, you see that there are three privateers, and you also see that there are three India men which they have captured. As for the privateers, it's just a fair match for you. One Englishman can always beat three Frenchmen. We must lick the privateers for honor and glory, and we must recapture the ships for profit, because you'll all want some money when you get on shore again. So you've just a half dozen things to do, and then we'll pipe to dinner. This harangue suited the sailors very well, and they returned to their guns. Now, Peter, said O'Brien, just call away the sail trimmers from the guns, for I mean to fight these fellows under sail and outmaneuver them if I can. Uh, tell Mr. Webster I want to speak with him. Mr. Webster was the second lieutenant, a very steady, quiet young man, and a good officer. Mr. Webster, said O'Brien, remember that all the foremost guns must be very much depressed. I prefer that the shot should strike the water before it reaches them, rather than it should go over them. See that your screws are run up at once, and I will take care that no broadside is thrown away. Uh, starboard, Swinburne. Starboard it is, sir. Steady. So, that's right for the stern of the leeward vessel. We were within two cable lengths of the privateers, who still remained hove to within half a cable's length of each other. They were very large schooners, full of men, with their boarding netting triced up, and showing a very good set of teeth, as it afterwards proved. One mounted sixteen, and the other two fourteen guns. Now, my lads, over to the lee guns, and fire as they bear, when we round two. Hands by the head braces, and jib sheet. Stretch along the weather braces. Quartermaster aft, tend the boom sheet. Port hard, Swinburne. Port it is, sir, replied Swinburne, and the brig rounded up on the wind, shooting up under the sterns of the two weathermost schooners, and discharging the broadside into them as the guns bore. Be smart and load, my lads, and stand by the same guns. Round in the weatherhead braces. Peter, I don't want her to go about. Stand by to haul over the boom sheet when she pays off. Swinburne, helm and midships. By this time another broadside was poured into the schooner, who had not yet returned our fire, which, having foolishly remained hove to the wind, they could not do. The brig now had sternway, and O'Brien then executed a very skillful maneuver. He shifted the helm and made a stern board, so as to back in between the two weather schooners and the one to leeward, bracing around at the same time on the other tack. Man both sides, my lads, and give them our broadsides as we pass. The men stationed to the starboard guns flew over, and the other side, being again loaded, we exchanged broadside with a leeward and one of the windward schooners, the brig continuing her stern way until we passed ahead of them. By the time that we had reloaded, the brig had gathered headway and again passed between the same two schooners, giving broadsides and then passing astern of them. Capital, my lads, capital, said O'Brien. This is what I call good fighting. And so it was, for O'Brien had given two raking broadsides and four others, receiving only two in return, for the schooners were not ready for us when we passed between them the last time. The smoke had now rolled away to leeward, and we were able to see the effect of our broadsides. The middle schooner had lost her main boom and appeared very much cut up in the hull. The schooner to leeward did not appear to have suffered much, but they now perceived their error and made sail. They had expected that we should run in between them, 
and fought broadside to broadside, by which means the weathermost schooner would have taken a raking position, while the others engaged us to windward and leeward. Our own damages were trifling, two men slightly wounded, and one main shroud cut away. We ran about half a mile astern from them, then, with both broadsides ready, we tacked, and found that, as we expected, we could weather the whole of them. This we did, O'Brien running the brig within biscuit throw of the weathered schooner, engaging him broadside to broadside, with the advantage that the other two could not fire a shot into us without standing a chance of striking their consort. If he made more sail, so did we, and if he shortened, so did we, so as to keep our position with little variation. The schooner fought well, but her metal was not to be compared with our thirty-two pound carronades, which ploughed up her sides at so short a distance, driving two ports into one. At last her foremast went by the board, and she dropped astern. In the meantime, the other schooners had both tacked, and were coming up under our stern to rake us. But the accident which happened to the one we had engaged left us at liberty. We knew that she could not escape, so we tacked and engaged the other two, nearing them as fast as we could. The breeze now sprang up fast, and O'Brien put up the helm and passed between them, giving them both a raking broadside of grape and canister, which brought the sticks about their ears. This sickened them. The smallest schooner which had been the leewardest at the commencement of the action made all sail on a wind. We clapped on the royals to follow her, when we perceived that the other schooner, which had been in the middle, and whose main boom we had shot away, had put her helm up and was crowding all sail before the wind. O'Brien then said, Must not try for too much, or we shall lose all. Put her about, Peter. We must be content with the one that has left us. We went about and ranged up to the schooner which had lost her foremast, but she, finding that her consort had deserted her, hauled down her colors, just as we were about to pour in our broadside. Our men gave three cheers, and it was pleasant to see them all shaking hands with each other, congratulating and laughing at the successful result of our action. Now, my lads, be smart. We've done enough for honor, now for profit. Peter, take the two cutters full of men, and go on board of the schooner while I get a hold of the three West India men. Rig something jury forward and follow me. In a minute, the cutters were down and full of men. I took possession of the schooner, while the brig again tacked, and, crowding all sail, stood after the captured vessels. The schooner, which was the largest of the three, was called the Jean d'Arc, mounting sixteen guns, and had fifty-three men on board, the remainder being away in the prizes. The captain was wounded very badly, and one officer killed. Out of her ship's company, she had but eight killed and five wounded. They informed me that they had sailed three months ago from St. Pierre's Martinique, and had fallen in with the other two privateers, and cruised in company, having taken nine West India men since they had come out. Pray, said I to the officer who gave the information, were you ever attacked by boats when you laid at St. Pierre's? He replied, yes, and that they had beaten them off. Did you purchase these masts of an American? He replied in the affirmative, so that we had captured the very vessel, in attempting to cut out, which we had lost so many men. We were all very glad of this, and Swinburne said, Well, hang me if I didn't think I had seen that porthole before. There it was that I wrenched a pike out of one of the rascal's hands who tried to stab me. And into that porthole I fired at least a dozen muskets. Well, I'm damned glad we got a hold of the beggar at last. We secured the prisoners below and commenced putting the schooner in order. 
in half an hour we had completed our knotting and splicing and having two of the carpenters with us in an hour we had got up a small jury mast forward sufficient for the present we lowered the mainsail put trysails on her and stood after the brig which was now close to the prizes but they separated and it was not till dark that she had possession of two the third was then hauled down on the other tack with the brig in chase we followed the brig as did the two recaptured vessels and even with our jury up we found that we could sail as fast as they the next morning we saw the brig hove to and about three miles ahead with the three vessels in her possession we closed and i went on board webster was put in charge of the privateer and after lying to for that day to send our prize masters and men on board to remove the prisoners we got up a proper jury mast and all made sail together for barbados on my return on board i found that we had but one man and one boy killed and six wounded which i was not aware of i forgot to say that the names of the other two privateers were la etoile and la madeleine in a fortnight we arrived with all our prizes safe in carlesley bay where we found the admiral who had anchored but two days before i hardly need say that o'brien was well received and gained a great deal of credit for the action i found several letters from my sister the contents of which gave me much pain my father had been some months in ireland and had returned without gaining any information my sister said that he was very unhappy paid no attention to his clerical duties and would sit for days without speaking that he was very much altered in his appearance and had grown thin and careworn in short said she my dear peter i am afraid that he is fretting himself to death of course i am very lonely and melancholy i cannot help reflecting upon what will be my situation if any accident should happen to my father except my uncle's protection i will not yet how am i to live for my father has saved nothing i have been very busy lately trying to qualify myself for a governess and practice the harp and piano for several hours every day i shall be very very glad when you come home again i showed the letters to o'brien who read them with much attention i perceived the colour mount into his cheeks when he read those parts of her letters in which she mentioned his name and expressed her gratitude for his kindness towards me never mind peter said o'brien returning me the letters to whom is it that i am indebted for my promotion and this brig but to you and for all the prize money which i have made and which by the head of st patrick comes to a very decent sum but to you make yourself quite easy about your dear little sister we we'll club your prize money and mine together and she shall marry a duke if there be one in england deserving her and it's the french that shall furnish her dowry as sure as a rattlesnake carries a tail chapter forty six